Hi, and welcome to another video on UiPath with me, Jeppe. In this one, we're taking a look at the robotic enterprise framework. It's a topic that a lot of people are hesitant to dig into. Uh, there's been a lot of videos made and a lot of them are really good. This is my take on how you can approach it. And I'm going to do it in steps. So in this video, we're going to focus on if and why you should use it. And I'm going to give you a quick overview of the different parts of the framework. Then in the next videos, we'll take each of those parts and really dig into them. And in the final video, we'll do a demo automation based on the robotic enterprise framework. So let's get to it. Imagine you have a development team, Jeppe, Bob, and Jill. They are each tasked with building three different automations based on some different uh, business processes. So I'm tasked with building three automations, and so is Bob, and so is Jill. And they're all different automations. Now, the way I approach my automations, there are some similarities in how I do things from one automation to the next. They're not all the same, but I kind of know what I'm doing when I'm automating stuff. And the same goes for Bob, but he does things just a little differently than from how I do it. And Jill, well, she does things her way. And, you know, now we have nine different automations, and they're done in nine different ways. And of course, each automation is different, but the approach to how these nine are built, you know, they are also somewhat different from one automation to the other. And that's okay as long as there are only nine automations. But what happens is that we are tasked with more processes and we develop those automations as well. And what happens is the business grows because we're using RPA. So of course the business grows. So Chuck and Joe join the team. And now all of us are tasked with more automations that we need to build. And all of a sudden, we have a lot of automations built. And that's not a good thing if we don't know what we're doing and if we don't do things more or less the same way every time. Especially because Bob and Chuck decide to leave the team. So now we have to maintain the automations that they built. And maybe their documentation standards are not the same as ours. And maybe the way they code things is very different from how I do it or how Jill does it or Joe. So now we're really in, in a lot of problems. It would have been so much nicer if all of us did our automations in more or less the same way. Of course, we can't just build one automation and then copy it to all of the different business cases. But the way we approach the automation, how we load settings, how we handle exceptions, how we load data, how we process data. If we do that in a similar fashion across all of our automations, it's so much easier for me to maintain or correct errors in an automation that Jill built or Chuck built uh, and the same the other way around. And one way to do that is by using a, a template. And in UiPath Studio, there are lots of uh, different templates for different types of projects. And for most enterprise automations, a really good option is the robotic enterprise framework, also known as the reframework. And that's what we're going to look at now. So when you open Studio, you have the option of using one of the many templates included. And one of them is the robotic enterprise framework. So we start with that. And I've actually cheated a little bit because when we open the main workflow, we can see that the main workflow in this template is actually empty. And that's because I want to build the template with you. And we're going to build in this video, we're going to build the sort of the shell of the entire framework. And then in the next videos, we'll dig into each of the different sections. I'm doing that because I don't want you to get scared of the framework. It does have some complexity to it, but it's manageable and you can learn it. And once you do, and I hope by the end of my video series, I really hope you understand the basics of it. You will really reap the benefits. I mean, the benefits are tremendous. So let's get into it. We'll start by drawing the different sections of the framework in this video get a good overview and then in the next video that's coming out in a couple of days we'll start digging a little bit deeper. So the framework is built up as a state machine and a state machine is a type of workflow where what happens is dictated by triggers or by conditions between different states. So you move from one state to another through what are called transitions. And the first state that you sort of transition into in the robotic enterprise framework is the initialization state. Inside of this uh, state, if I double click, there's a bunch of code and we'll go through that in another video. But what this does is it reads a configuration file and it initializes different applications that we use during this automation. So this phase or this state of the framework gets things ready for us to do some real work. Now, this needs to be connected to the start node up here. 
And we can just do that by drawing a line from one of the connection points to a connection point here in the init state. Now the init state will start complaining because the state like this has to move on to another state until you hit what is called an end state. Uh, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But in this first state code is executed that reads configuration from a file. We'll go through that also later. Uh, and then starts up the applications that we need during this automation. Once those things are started, we can start to worry about data. And usually what you want to do when you automate something is you want to process some kind of data. And in order to process data, you need to first get data. And you do that in a state called get transaction data. And the get transaction data state, like the initialization state, contains a bunch of code that gets some data from whatever data source you need to process data from. And then it, uh, it, it passes it on to the actual processing. But just like the initialization state, we need to connect the init state here and the get transaction data state with, uh, with a connection. And we'll do that by drawing a line from one to the other. And this creates what I told you before is named a transition. And we'll get into transitions and their naming and uh, stuff like that in just a few minutes. Now, if something goes wrong up here in the init state, for example, if we want to start up Excel and it doesn't even exist on the server that we're running the automation on, or if the internet connection is down so we cannot access the website that we want, maybe just some, some applications simply will not start for some reason then you want to end the processing. And that's where you get to this special type of state that is called an end state. And we'll paste one in over here. And it's simply called end process. And there are two ways uh, of ending up in this end process state. The first one, as I said, is if something catastrophic happens uh, in the initialization state, then we simply want to move to the end state and not move any further along with our automation. Another instance where you can get to the end process state is when the get transaction data is unsuccessful in retrieving any data, because then there's nothing to process. Then you also want to move from the get transaction data state to the end process state. And again, we have a, a transition between the two of these, and I'll get into how and why one transition happens instead of another in just a little while. So if we assume that the get transaction data state completes successfully and actually retrieves some data for us, then we want to move into the real bread and butter of uh, automation, which is where we process our data. So I'll paste in a process transaction state here. And that state is where we do the actual data processing. Again, I want to connect that to my get transaction data state, because once we've gotten data, we want to process it. And we do that by, again, drawing a transition here. Now, three things can happen in the processing of a transaction. Either things go well or things go not so well. And you may be thinking, well, that's only two things. Well, when not going so well, it can be either bad or really, really bad. And really, really bad is when you have a system exception. For example, if an application crashes or something like that, you lose the internet connection in the middle of the processing. Then you want to go from the process transaction state back up, sorry, back up to the initialization state. And the reason why you want to do that is you want to retry the processing of this transaction. And we'll get into it a little bit later, but on each transaction, there is a retry count so that you can define that a failing transaction or failed transaction should be retried, you know, one or two or three times before finally failing or hopefully succeeding. So if something catastrophic happens in the processing of the transaction, we want to move back to the initialization state and we want to reload all of the applications that we needed to process the transaction, assuming that one of them crashed down here. Another thing can happen, and that is you get what is called a business rule exception. And a business rule exception is simply a breach of some kind of business rule. That doesn't mean that it's a catastrophe or anything like that. It just means that for some reason, this data item cannot be processed. You know, you can have business rules that say we can only process sales orders automatically that are below a certain amount. Well, if that rule is broken, then we don't want to process it automatically. We break the business rule, throw a business rule exception and handle that and maybe send an email to a person who will then handle the sales order manually. So when we experience a business rule exception, what we want to do is we want to go also to the get transaction data state because we simply want to get the next data item 
that is ready for processing. And that's something I forgot to mention in the get transaction data state. You get data one item at a time, and then you process that one item. And then if it succeeds, and we can draw that in now, then you get back, you go back up and get the next item. If that succeeds, you get the next item. If that has a business rule exception, you get the next item because we don't retry business rule exception. And if we get uh, to the process transaction state and something really bad happens, we take this route back up to the init state and then uh, the applications are restarted, data is reloaded, and we try again until the retry count reaches its maximum and then it will simply fail completely. So this is really the basics of the robotic enterprise framework. You want to initialize your settings, your applications. If that fails, you simply end the process. If the initialization succeeds, you try to get some data. If you succeed in getting data, then you process the data. And you keep processing data, handling all of the errors and exceptions along the way uh, accordingly. And once there's no more data to process, you move to the end process. And that's the end of your processing. So it's a lot to take in, but this is the basics. And this is actually what the framework template looks like if you load it up. It does have some better naming on all of these transitions. And let me explain why. On this transition right here, if we look at the properties window up here, we can see that it has two properties. It has a display name, T2, and that's the one we can see here. And it has a condition. Let's change the display name to system exception because this is the route we take if a system exception occurs in the init state. If a system exception occurs, then we want to go to the end process. But how do we determine if that has occurred? Well, in our variables pane down here, we have a number of variables. Among these, you find a system exception and you find a business exception. And these are two variables that you set whenever a business or system exception occurs. And if something happens up here in the initialization state, you want to set the system exception variable to something other than nothing. You want to create a new instance of a, an exception object. So what you do is, in this transition, the other property, which is called the condition property, you set the condition for taking this route from the init state to the end state. And in this case, our condition is that the system exception variable is not nothing. So when whatever code is in this initialization state finishes, if the system exception variable is not nothing, meaning that there is a system exception, then we go to the end process state. Now, if there is no system exception, or if the system exception variable, I should say, is nothing, then we want to go to get the data in the get transaction data section. So we can um, type in success. Oh, if I can spell. And we can set the condition here that the system exception object is nothing. Because there are only two options. Either the system exception variable is nothing or is not nothing. And if it is nothing, we have a success. We move on to the get transaction data. If it is not nothing, then we're in the process. So what happens down here in the get transaction data? Well, it's sort of similar actually to what happens up here in, in the init state as far as the transitions go, because we have two possible outcomes. Either we find some data or we don't find some data. And if we look in the variables again, we have this variable called transaction item. And that's the one data item that we've retrieved inside of the get transaction data state. And if that transaction item is empty, then we want to go to the end process because there's no data to process. But if it's not empty, then we want to move down into our process transaction section. So we can set these transition values. We can set the display name of this one to no more data. And we can set the condition to be transaction item is nothing. So if no transaction item was found, then we go to the end process. If data was found, that means that the transaction item is not nothing. And we can name it new transaction found. I don't remember what the actual name is in the, the actual framework template, but this is good enough for, for now.
So now we have both transitions from the get transaction data sorted out. All we need to do now is we need to figure out, okay, how do we move on from the process transaction data to either get transaction data or to the initialization state? Well, we had these two variables down here, the system exception and the business exception. Well, if the system exception is not nothing, then we want to move up to the init state. So we type in if system exception is not nothing, then this is the route we take. And we rename that to system exception. This one was the business rule exception. So we'll call this business, we'll just call it business exception. And the condition for us to take this route from process transaction to get more transaction data is that the business exception is not nothing, right? And then the final route we can take from processing to getting more data. That is if the processing of the data that we already had was actually successful. So we give it display name success, and we set the condition that business exception is nothing, and also system exception is nothing. So now we have all three possible outcomes of the processing of the transaction item that we had retrieved in the get transaction data state. And if you open the framework in your own UiPath Studio, this is what you'll see. This is the basics of the framework. You initialize your settings and your applications. If that fails, you end the automation. If it succeeds, you try to get some data. If that fails, you end the automation. If the getting of the data succeeds, you process the data. And if that succeeds, you get more data. If it fails because of a business rule exception, then you also get the next data item. And if it fails because something really, really bad happens with an application or something like that, you get a system exception and you move back to the init state and kind of start over. And that's really the important takeaway from this video is that the process and the logic behind all of this is really fairly simple. Now, of course, if we look in the project overview over here, we can see that we have some folders and we have some files in here in the framework folder, for example. We have quite a few workflow files and we have a data folder here with an Excel workbook inside of it. And there's some complexity to, to that. But these are all just files that are being invoked from within these four states that we have as the main building blocks of the framework template. And we'll get through all of those elements in the next videos. And how do you get to see those videos? Well, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Uh, so you subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell, then you'll be notified when new videos come out. And I'll try to make these videos fairly quickly, so in the next few days, more and more videos will be coming out. I will be linking to them at the end of this video when they're ready, and also putting them in the description below this video. So I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you learned something. Give it a thumbs up if you did, and we'll see you hopefully in the next one. Stay safe. Thanks. Bye.